Good evening, comrades. Thank you for joining us to tonight's session in our series, uh, History of Israel and Palestine. This is an additional session that we uh, put on at sort of shortish notice to deal with current affairs uh, to a degree. Because um, while we were going ahead with our series, uh, the whole idea of conscription came back. That's really been in the news a lot lately. And not just in Britain, I should say, also in Germany, there's a huge debate. Should you have conscription, et cetera? We'll discuss tonight, is this really about conscription? Is conscription feasible? Is it perhaps for, from a communist point of view, a good thing to get arms into everybody's hands, et cetera, et cetera? But we'll also look, of course, at the drive to World War III, which really is what we think behind all this talk about conscription. Very pleased that um, Ian has prepared an opening. So without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good evening, comrades. Um, in January, uh, the Minister of Defence, Grant Schatz, uh, said that, uh, a quote here, we are moving from a post-war to a pre-war world. And on the 24th of January, uh, General Sir Patrick Sanders, Chief of the General Staff, effectively Head of the Army, was quoted in an article in the Times arguing that the British Army recruitment simply can't keep up with the numbers of personnel leaving. The current army strength of 74,000 is likely to fall to 70,000 in two years. He went on to propose that Britain should train a citizen army of around 120,000, consisting of, I quote, uh, regular reserves and a strategic reserve of former service personnel who can be recalled in time of emergency. Um, the distinction between uh, volunteer reserves, formerly the Territorial Army and the Royal Naval Reserve and the Royal Auxiliary Air Force, now, now they're all just called the something or other reserve, and, and regular reserves is an old one, and, and, and I'll say more about that later because it's an interesting distinction. I'm sure that General Saunders is also aware that the Minister of Defence already has the power to recall former service personnel in time of war um, if they're under 55 and have served within 18 years in the army and six in the navy. So um, imagine that you 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 joined up for three years uh, in the hope of getting your um, uh, heavy goods vehicle licence. And if you don't read the small print, uh, within 18 years of having left, uh, you could be recalled to the colours. Um, the following day, uh, after this letter, after this uh, thing was reported in the Times, uh, in a letter to the Times, the former Deputy Supreme Commander of NATO, General Sir Richard Sheriff, um, Sheriff uh, added his support, adding that the British Army would have the greatest difficulty, quote, coming to the aid of a NATO ally with, quote, personnel numbers in free fall. The cost of expansion by volunteers is likely to be out of the question, even if the numbers of young men and women needed were prepared to come forward, which is unlikely, unquote. Um, the concern isn't confined to the USA, into the UK. Uh, as uh, Tina has said, in Germany, um, SPD uh, Defence Minister Boris Pistorius has said that Germany must be prepared for direct confrontation with Russia. Um, Inspector General Karsten Rohr, Rohr uh, has supported uh, has supported that in an interview in Veltum Sontag and talked about the need to quote ensure that the armed forces are able to grow so that we can hold our own in a war. Um, while nobody seriously believes that Russia is going to invade the UK, the possibility of an escalation in the war in, in between Russia and Ukraine is a real one. Um, particularly given the real given the rates of attrition uh, of Ukrainians, means that Russia is regaining ground lost in the last two years and consolidating its hold on predominantly Russian-speaking parts of Ukraine and the strategically important Crimea. Um, it's a major port for the Black Sea. And if you, uh, and if to reinforce the urgency of the situation, the largest NATO exercise since the Cold War, Exercise Steadfast Defender, is currently taking place from all the way from northern Norway to Greece. Um, but that involves uh, 90,000 NATO troops, uh, 20, uh, including 20,000 from the UK and 25,000 from the USA. Um, and that's likely to continue until May. Um, I don't wish to alarm anybody. But May is a good time normally to start a, a campaign. Um, 
Then there's the whole genocidal war being waged by Israel on Palestine and the Houthi support for the Palestinians, leading to shipping being diverted away from the Suez Canal, which is likely to draw in uh, Royal Navy vessels with Royal Marines and RAF aircraft into the Red Sea. So what is the likelihood of any UK or German government or any other for that matter being able to introduce conscription and how useful would those conscripts be? Um, should we be mobilising to resist it now? And what is meant by a citizen army? And what attitude should socialists take to a citizen army as opposed to a professional army? Um, spoiler alert, I'm going to argue that we should absolutely um, be mobilising to oppose a future war um but i'm going to argue that uh the likelihood of um britain in particular perhaps of successfully mobilizing significant numbers of people uh, as conscripts is a bit far-fetched and and i'll go on to explain why i'm going to make some reference to um military and veteran mental health which is which 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 we want to be used to one of, used to be one of my research and teaching topics, um, because I think not so much because it's a, a rates of psychiatric disorder are any higher in the military than anywhere else. In fact, they're, they're usually lower, um, but because I think it's a key indicator of some of the problems that the um, British Army in particular will face, and I suggest that it's the British Army isn't that unusual from that point of view. Um, generally speaking, um, the bourgeoisie prefers a professional army. It prefers a, um, a, a, a committed army which is um, generally reasonably well paid and, and well resourced feudal armies were often billeted on local populations and um often received their reward by plunder or whatever else um a modern professional army is a feature of uh, of the coming into being of capitalism um not that um uh, no one has recognised the importance of a, a, a political commitment to the cause, as it were. Um, Oliver Cromwell, in talking about uh, the appointment of officers to the new model army, famously said that he would prefer a plain russet-coated captain who knows what he fights for and loves what he knows. And uh, as people who are familiar with the history of the 17th century and the English Revolution in particular, um, Political tensions existed in the new model army to the extent of um, sections of the uh, of the new model army being radicalized to extend the franchise uh, and uh, to abolish not only the monarchy uh, but uh, the House of Lords and a whole range of other kind of reforms that uh, that Cromwell subsequently wasn't prepared to allow. So generally speaking, the bourgeoisie prefers a, a, a professional army. And the, the attitude of Marxists has been, well, the attitude of Marx and Engels uh, was that effectively a, a, a professional standing army is an army which can be uh, an adjunct to the bourgeoisie's uh, domination and rule over the proletariat. In looking at the drive to World War III, we're looking at a world in which there is the decline of capitalism. Um, the USA in the 1950s hardly needed to exert its influence purely by force. Um, it, it was a period of unparalleled uh, uh, growth and uh, prosperity in the United States. Uh, at various other times, uh, Britain too has been able to enforce its will, not by just sheer violence, although the, the threat of violence is always there uh, w w when you have a professional standing army. Um, but what we're seeing is the decline of capitalism in general and the decline of the USA relative to, for example, China. And China really is the main enemy as far as uh, the USA is concerned. Um, arguably, what's taking place in uh, Russia uh, at the moment and Ukraine is a proxy war being waged by NATO in order to ensure uh, that Russia is subjugated before it takes on the real enemy. Uh, as far as uh, the USA is concerned. Um, 
I was put there a, a two front confrontation. Um, the reason why I did that is because when, when you think about the First World War, uh, the von Schlieffen plan was concerned with the danger that Germany faced fighting a war on two fronts, Russia on the one side and France and its allies on the other. And um, one could argue that what the USA is doing is ensuring that either um, Russia is tied up in uh, an unwinnable war that is draining its resources, um, or that it can be suitably vanquished. Uh, a, a Ukraine could be incorporated into, if not NATO directly, then into the um, what we might call the US sphere of influence. And of course, that has been the great fear of Vladimir Putin from, from the outset. Um, so the question is, is uh, what's the likelihood then of this being of it, of it escalating further? I don't think it's very likely uh, that Russia has any hope whatsoever of occupying the whole of Ukraine. Um, it, it is almost certainly going to consolidate its hold over the predominantly Russian speaking parts of the Ukraine it currently it currently occupies. Um, the question is, is NATO going to be prepared to sit and watch uh, whilst uh, Ukraine is is bled dry? And what are the prospect? What are the prospects of a um, casus belli, uh, a, a, a cause being uh, either manufactured or, uh, or 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 existing by chance uh, for a full scale uh, uh, assistance of of Ukraine and? How does this tie up, for example, uh, with uh, the forthcoming election of Donald Trump? Um, in looking at the, the Middle East, of course, now, uh, this is predominantly about the whole question about whether uh, Britain can uh, actually bring in conscription. I'm not convinced it can. But in, in looking at the Middle East, of course, um, it has added a new set, a, a, a new complexity. To what extent, for example, is, is uh, involvement in British troops uh, going to be uh, necessary at any point, for example, in Yemen? The likelihood is uh, that most of it will be done uh, at one removed, um, by whether by uh, air attacks or whatever else. Um, and... And we know, for example, um, that there has been threatening noises uh, with regard to Iran in terms of Iran's support for the Houthis, Hezbollah, and so on. Um, what are the chances of um, uh, uh, Egypt being destabilized by what's taking place in, in Palestine uh, and indeed Jordan too? It is interesting uh, that Jordan um, was one of the countries most vociferous in supporting uh, South Africa in, in terms of uh, its action in the uh, international uh, court, uh, international court, uh, looking at whether um, Israel is, is perpetrating genocide. So let's have a little think for a moment about what we mean by a citizen army, or at least what Marxists think about as a citizen army. Um, some of you will have seen pictures like this before, uh, the, the Paris Commune of 1871, um, really just uh, a matter of uh, weeks in which the French National Guard, which had been radicalised, um, of course, uh, different parts of the National Guard uh, from different arrondissements, uh, whether they were you know, middle class ones would be more likely to simply support the Republican government, uh, whereas uh, more working class arrondissements uh, were, 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 were thoroughly radicalised. But in um, the civil war in France, um, Marx is... Uh, speaks very is learns this is one it's the one of the most important lessons that Marx had learned and it's one of the few things that caused him to re subsequently revise uh, anything within the communist manifesto here we have something which is uh, not a, a professional standing army it is effectively the workers in arms male and female uh, and under democratic control and in a commune where workers' representatives are paid no more than the workers they represent, and those representatives being subject to recall. So there's the possibility here of the kind of democratic control over the, the French National Guard, which Cromwell had uh, obstinately refused to countenance in the new model army. Um, World War One, one could argue, was something, something, 
of a citizen army. And uh, bourgeois historians of World's World Wars One and Two will often argue that, in fact, uh, what you have is the mass mobilization of the entire population, which, of course, is 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 true on one level. Um, oh, that's it. World War One. Um, again, as I've mentioned, it was uh, born of a of, of a fear of a two front confrontation on the part of uh, of the German High Command. Um, but it was also born, of course, on competing in imperialist interests between Britain uh, and Germany. And uh, at the time, um, the British army, and in fact, at the height of the British Empire, the British army was never more than, than 300,000 strong. So uh, in 1914, for example, the British army was about 270,000 plus 60,000 reserves. But what was considered separate was what was called then the territorial force. Uh, subsequently later called the Territorial Army. Um, and the Territorial Force, which came into uh, being in, in 1908 as a kind of rationalisation of all the different militia bodies um, that uh, were, had constituted the reserve forces uh, before uh, 1908. So different county militias, often with the local Lord Lieutenant of the county, who would be the Colonel-in-Chief, that kind of malarkey, uh, was, was rationalised uh, and, and enlarged and called initially the territorial force. It was originally recruited uh, and, and set up for home defence only. Uh, so it took over the militia uh, role. Uh, so for home defence and, of course, putting down revolutions. I mean, the, 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 the massacre of people in, uh, in Tolpuddle, uh, in St. Peter's Fields in Tolpuddle. Um, uh, sorry, the, the, in St. Peter's... Peterloo, the Peterloo massacre in St Peter's Fields in Manchester um, uh, was 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 perpetrated by a, a militia uh, controlled by a local landlord, effectively. Uh, but the territorial force was to be something else. It was to be a part-time professional reserve, uh, predominantly uh, for home defence and putting down the possibility of revolution at home. It's not accidental that Aldershot is where it is or that the barracks of the household cavalry are in the middle of London, along with uh, the, the whole of the household division. Um, uh, there has always been a need to station soldiers near large urban conurbations, which are seen as the potential um, um, breeding ground of revolutionary activity. What's often overlooked uh, is that conscription was not introduced until 1916, January 1916, before conscription. In fact, uh, at the early part of World War I, um, the War Office was overwhelmed by the number of people who were volunteering to go. Uh, the reason why the Black and Tans were so-called in the, in the Irish War of Independence um, was that there were these strange people who would turn up with a, a black jacket and brown trousers or vice versa. And the, the black, or what was more widely known as Kitchener Blue, um, uh, were the temporary uniforms that were issued to the, the, the thousands of men who had volunteered. And there, there simply weren't enough khaki uniforms, not least of which because the colour khaki uh, was, uh, well, em embarrassingly made in Germany. Um, and so uh, the uh, so a, a lot of the early uh, recruits were, were, were kitted out in blue uniforms. So conscription not introduced to 1916 and not at all in Ireland. Uh, and notwithstanding that, thousands of Irish Irishmen, or Protestant and Catholic, uh, volunteered and fought in the trenches of the First World War, even though the Republican movement's um, uh, motto was neither King nor Kaiser, but Ireland. Um, and of course, the Indian army, uh, which was pretty much a million strong by the end of the war, um, also uh, was a volunteer army. But by 1918, World War I, uh, three million eight hundred twenty thousand was the strength of the British Army. Um, a lot has been. I'm going to mention something here about uh, people who were executed, uh, either for the majority. There were three thousand and eighty people who were sentenced sent, uh, sentenced to death. Only around three hundred forty six were actually shot at dawn. Um, about twenty five of those, twenty seven of those, were um, people who were shot for things like murder or murder and rape, or things that they would have been hanged for in civilian life. Um, it's often thought that somehow uh, 
you know, hundreds of uh, shell shocked uh, victims were, were 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 marched off to be to be shot and so on. Relatively few. There were some, of course, core celeb, poor private Harry Farr uh, and others. But not, notwithstanding that, it's it, it, there weren't really that many. Um, of course, three hundred and forty-six is is brutal enough, and most of them were executed for desertion in the face of the enemy, casting away weapons, and a number of other capital offences in military law at the time. Only some uh, were found subsequently to be poss possibly uh, suffering from what was then known as shell shock. Actually, um, there were at the outbreak of the war there were no army neurologists or psychiatrists there was nobody who could give a professional view on the matter one way or the other and simply relied upon general duties medical of medical officers of the royal army medical corps by september 1917 there was a significant mutiny at etaple et, 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 um, uh, and of course there were mutinies in the french army which led to the removal of uh, nivelle and his replacement by a marshal pétain subsequently marshal pétain uh, so um the reason why i mention it is because um can you imagine anybody being shot for desertion today uh let alone shot for um doing something that might be construed as uh, as as a, as a result of shell shock um other examples of citizen armies are, are interesting to have a quick look at. I, this isn't really the time to discuss them in any detail, but I did want, want to mention the Soviet Red Army because um, on the face of it, it was a workers and peasants Red Army established uh, in January 1918, founded by the Council of People's Commissars and under the leadership of, uh, of Lef, Leon Trotsky, Lev Trotsky. Um, June 1918, um, Trotsky had ended workers' control and the election of officers. Um, it, people who were, you know, people who I've known in the past who were uh, more anarchistically inclined were saying, well, it's a good example of what Trotsky was like. But put yourself in Trotsky's position at the time. Um, it, the, 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 the Tsarist army had been reduced to about 10 million uh, by desertions, around 2 million had deserted. Um, many other units were functionally useless from the point of view of being able to being willing or able uh, to fight, not least of which because many of them had no weapons at all. Um, so effectively, the, the, the people's militias, the workers' militias that existed were merged with the army. Um, this was predominantly still officered by Tsarist officers. Uh, and most of the soldiers were of peasant stock rather than rather than proletarians. Um, arguably, uh, what Trotsky was having to do was make the best of a bad job and turn it into uh, something resembling more closely uh, a bourgeois army for the per for the sheer purposes of being able to prosecute the war at all. But it it wasn't really. It, whilst there were significant elements of it that were in the legion and and certain regiments, uh, the machine gun corps, for example, uh, were were resolutely proletarian. Uh, and 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 politicized uh, to support the Bolsheviks. But nevertheless, uh, Trotsky was in a position of having to make the best of a bad job in terms of trying to turn an enormous army uh, to fight the white armies and incursions of uh, of so many other different countries trying to crush the young Soviet Republic. Um, let's also remember the Spanish Civil War. Um, the Popular Front government had won the election in uh, uh, February 1936, which was promptly followed by a coup by the Spanish army. The Spanish army was pretty evenly split. The generals were, of course, wanting to uh, overthrow the Popular Front government and restore order, as it were. Um, and um, Franco, who had been posted to the Canary Islands, uh, was actually in an ideal position. By being posted to the Canary Islands, he was effectively outside of the supervision of the Republican government. And the the, the basis for the support of uh, Franco's army uh, actually came from Spanish Morocco. If you recall in uh, George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia, one of the things he said was, why on earth did, they, did the Republican government not immediately declare uh, Spanish Morocco to be liberated, to be independent? Because that would have undermined his cause and instantly hugh thomas who's a historian of the spanish civil war argued that simply arming the workers immediately uh would have been a way in which uh the the revolution the uh 
uh, insurgent generals could have been brought to heel very, very quickly indeed. Um, of course, um, the Spanish Republic had support from the USSR and Mexico, from the USSR, but not without a cost. It had to be paid for. The weapons were actually paid for by Spanish gold. But the fascists, of course, also had militias. Um, the CGT, the PUM, the anarchists, CNT, FAI, all had, all had militias. Anyone who's familiar with Homage to Catalonia will know that George Orwell didn't join the International Brigades, not until later anyway, uh, when he tried but but didn't. <laughs> um, he uh, was actually in the Poon militia because he'd been a member of the um, Independent Labour Party and they had fraternal relations with the Poon. Um, he... Uh, was on the verge of trying to join the international brigades, which were founded in uh, 1936 under the aegis of, uh, of, of the Communist International. Um, but no, but before he could actually join, having been wounded, um, the the poom was suppressed, and in in the end, he took a side, and he took a side uh, on the side of the poom and on the side of the Spanish proletariat. The point about uh, the Spanish Civil War, of course, is uh, this isn't time to discuss it in any detail, but um, it, it was another example of politicised armies, uh, armies which were effectively the workers in arms. Um, and arguably, one of the things that was a feature was that as uh, these militias were incorporated into the National Army of Spain, uh, far from being more effective, uh, they were less effective. Um, there's a reason why I've put the cast of Dad's army on here. Uh, I'll, I'll explain. Um, the British Army in 1939, um, regular and reserve, that is to say territorial and, and regular, uh, was 892,697, including my dad. Uh, conscription was introduced in 1939, and... Um, by 1945, three million had served, uh, and uh, two. So it, the, 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 it was number two point nine million by 1945. But three million had gone through, had served in the in the British Army, effectively. Um, when one looks at psychiatric casualties as a kind of index, as it were, of of something going on that's um, related to perhaps resistance within. Uh, the context of, of of a military operation, psychiatric casualties were between 10 and 30%. They varied depending on the theatre of war. They depended upon the nature of the warfare. In the First World War, it was artillery versus infantry. And if you've got to sit in a trench uh, for hours and hours with shells landing all around you, that's got to be pretty stressful. Uh, by contrast, psychiatric casualties in North Africa, a war of movement involving a lot of tanks, didn't necessarily incur a lot of psychiatric casualties. What's interesting, though, and we'll see it later when we come to look at the Gulf War and the Iraq War, is that psychiatric casualties didn't necessarily occur in the places where you would most expect it. They didn't necessarily occur in uh, among um, people who were in the front line. Um, men who were discharged home in World War One with shell shock sometimes had been nowhere near an exploding shell. They'd actually been somewhere in the in the rear of the uh, of the of the military formation, um, and the same pattern was seen uh, in World War Two. Um, and uh, but and 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 it's also worth remembering that the, the the approach to psychiatric casualties changed over time. In World War One, people in 1914, 15, 16 were often sent home, and then the likelihood of getting them to come back uh, to military service was remote. After that, uh, treatment st stations were set up close to the front, and people were treated. Um, close to the front and with the expectation that they should go back to work. And that became the official army doctrine from World War II up to the present, that you're treated as close as possible to, to the point of psychiatric wounding, as it were, with a confident expectation uh, that you'll return to work. Um, but none were executed in World War II. No one was executed for, for desertion. Uh, no one was executed for uh, who was apparently shell-shocked. Um, uh, and quite often people who uh, came down with what came to be known as battle fatigue or a range of other kind of um, diagnoses, uh, semi-pseudo-diagnosis, semi, semi -pseudo -diagnosis, um, uh, 
uh, were often ended up serving in uh, rearward positions rather than just simply being sent home or discharged altogether. Um, the reason why the cast of Dad's Army is here, just is me being playful, um, but it's not widely appreciated that Home Guard was founded by a communist. <laughs> um, if not actually founded, then inspired by um, Thomas Henry Winchingham. Um, those are his dates, uh, 1898 and 1949. He sadly died of a heart attack at the age of 50 odd. Um, had served in the Royal Flying Corps as a mechanic and as a, um, a motorcycle dispatch rider, and then subsequently in the International Brigade. Um, he joined the Communist Party of Great Britain in 1923 uh, and helped to establish the Daily Worker uh, as, its, as its daily newspaper. Um, he, uh, because he had served in Spain, on return, what he wanted to do was uh, train 100,000 strong um, to resist uh, invasion. Uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps, the War Office wasn't too keen on the idea of 100,000 people trained by a communist uh, uh, in, um, in, in guerrilla warfare uh, being <laughs> in a kind of, any kind of senior position. Um, Winteringham actually started training people, started training volunteers before the foundation of the local defence volunteers, which was what the um, Home Guard was called before it was called the Home Guard. Um, Winteringham himself uh, broke with the Communist Party over the molotov ribbentrop Pact and subsequently uh, founded uh, the Commonwealth, uh, the Commonwealth Party, uh, not as in the, the British Commonwealth, but Commonwealth, uh, and it was a socialist party um, which uh, existed up until the end of the Second World War. Why I think um, conscription is a non-starter is to look at, firstly, no one was shot for desertion in the Second World War. Who would they shoot? If, if there was an attempt to conscript uh, uh, an unwilling population, I can assure you, uh, and the British government has said much the same thing, and so have other senior army officers, that actually what they don't want is conscripts, because conscripts are going to be more trouble than they're worth. And they're not necessarily going to be particularly good soldiers. Um, so let's have a contrast, for example, between Gulf War One and the Iraq War. Um, Gulf War syndrome is a whole complicated area in its own right, and I don't mean to trivialise it here. I don't deny for one moment that there are people who went through very real um, uh, and, and may still be suffering horribly uh, as a consequence of, uh, of their service during the Gulf War. But there were a number of important factors that were isolated, that were some of which are in the literature and at least one which isn't. Um, one is uh, the, the, the pattern of vaccines. Uh, before being dispatched to uh, the Gulf, uh, they were vaccinated for absolutely everything, including botulinum toxin and anthrax and God knows what. Um, and, of course, a whole series of, uh, of vaccinations all within a week um, is a significant assault on the, on the, on the body's immune system. Uh, they were also exposed to depleted uranium. There's a suggestion that organophosphates were uh, used in, in the Gulf War. And of course, every uh, soldier uh, would be would have been issued with pyridostigmine bromide tablets, so-called NAPS, NAPS tablets, which are a prophylactic measure uh, for preventing the possibility of, of being killed by nerve agents. Uh, and you take those and then if you're exposed to a nerve gas, uh, you inject yourself with 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 atropine. Um, so those are the things that are, are talked about in in the literature. One of the things that wasn't really talked about was the use of the regular reserve. If you recall, uh, early on, I said that the, 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 this general was uh, General Sher uh, Sh which one sheriff? Uh, no, the other one. Um, um, general Sir Patrick Sanders had been talking about there being, uh, as it were, three types: uh, regular. Uh, uh, reserve and soldiers who could be just uh, brought back at short notice who had previously been service personnel. The majority of the reservists that were mobilised in the Gulf War 
were called regular reserves. They were people who had not read the small print. They had signed up for three years in the hope of getting their HGV license. And they hadn't realized that they would be eligible for recall to the colors um, at short notice in wartime. So all of a sudden, somebody who hasn't been anywhere near the military for 10 years suddenly gets his call up papers and uh, and has to turn up. And he hasn't trained, he isn't fit, he is, isn't even remotely prepared and isn't remotely interested and certainly doesn't particularly want to die for queen and country or king and country as it will be now. Um, I'm not suggesting for one moment that is what constitutes Gulf War syndrome. I'm suggesting it's another factor, another thing in the, put, in the, in the pot. Because something that was interesting in the Iraq war, for example, um, there, there, there wasn't really an Iraq war syndrome. There were lots of people who suffered as a result of their service. There were lots of people who had what we might call PTSD. Uh, now, PTSD itself is interesting. It, it came into being as a di diagnostic category in 1980, as a mean in uh, the diagnostic and statistical uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the the American uh, DSM-3 diagnostic and statistical manual. Um, as a, as a means of of treating uh, the veterans of of uh, the Vietnam War, uh, without a proper diagnosis, uh, people manifesting with psychiatric symptoms such as uh, long term alcohol abuse, uh, short temperedness, all sorts of other bits and pieces, uh, depression, anxiety, and so on, um, as a, as a as a direct consequence of their military service, couldn't be treated because they didn't have a diagnosis and PTSD. Uh, was formulated as a diagnosis uh, for that for that very purpose, so that they could receive funding uh, from the Veterans Administration. And of course, uh, having made it into the DSM-3, it very quickly made its way eventually into the International Classification of Diseases. So there wasn't an Iraq war syndrome in the same way. Now, why? Is it, for example, that the pattern of um, vaccines was changed, which is undoubtedly true? Uh, they weren't quite as many and they weren't quite as close together and so on. Was it uh, that they hadn't been exposed really to organophosphates in quite the same way? Because they were all still taking their NAPS tablets, that's for sure. And um, But one other thing that's quite interesting um, was that they were different reservists. These were volunteer reserves. Uh, they didn't just round up people who been in the army 10 years ago and say oh, off you go son uh there's the small print uh here, here, here's a uniform here's a rifle um far from it what what they did was approach the what was then the territorial army and say who fancies going to war and what were called intelligent mobilization and so most of the reservists who volunteered volunteered because they wanted to go um because going to Iraq and possibly being shot at by Iraqis was better than working for, I don't know, Staffordshire University or wherever. Um, and um, But there were very similar kinds of mental health casualties. Um, now, this is notwithstanding the fact that they're both relatively short and wars. Uh, um, but what was also interesting, of course, is that in the Iraq war, one of the things that was noted was that the uh, psychiatric casualties were higher among the reserves. This is notwithstanding the fact that the reservists were generally older, of higher rank, generally better educated, partly because of the distribution of reservists. So lots of medics and you know doctors and various other people who would be who would be in the reserves, and uh, so uh, all factors which normally mean that your your, your mental health will be better, but. Um, uh, there were higher rates of, uh, of psychiatric casualties among reservists than there were in the regulars. I want to suggest that one of the reasons for that is there's a kind of resistance. Given that you're stuck doing something that you really don't want to do, one way is to go sick. Now, I'm not suggesting anyone was making it up or anything of the sort, but the kinds of stresses that you're put under as a regular soldier who's committed to doing it is different from if you're all of a sudden pitched in as an individual or mentee into a unit where you don't know anybody, where uh, and your your status is really quite low as a reservist. And um, and what was interesting was that, for example, lots of uh, the casualties weren't among infantry soldiers who'd been having firefights with 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 insurgents. Far from it, they were cooks, storemen. Uh, they were people in what are otherwise known as combat uh, service support duties. They, they weren't frontline troops. They were the troops who. Um, 
mended the rifles uh, if they if they were broken or fixed the Land Rovers or whatever. And these were the people who were turning up in uh, in military uh, regimental aid posts uh, with with psychiatric symptoms. So. Um, and actually, the, the interesting thing was, was there was a resonance between that even and, and the First World War, where where soldiers who ha hadn't been anywhere near uh, an exploding shell were, were reporting sick. So all I'm saying here is that the likelihood of um, uh, conscription being employed is remote because uh, for, for all the grandstanding that's been taking place in um, among these generals in the times um and and, and grant shaps um for all their grandstanding uh, th there is still no appetite as far as i'm aware for the idea of having lots of young people with no wish whatsoever to be in the armed forces and no wish whatsoever to die uh, in in ukraine or anywhere else for that matter uh, the likelihood of russia invading Poland or invading the Baltic republics is fanciful. I mean, given what they couldn't do in Ukraine, the likelihood that they could overrun Poland or Austria or Germany or anywhere else is just absurd. Um, and similarly, I would argue the likelihood that the United... I may be wrong here and I may be forced to eat my words, but the likelihood that, that, that the United States would go to war uh, if China did invade Taiwan, um, is again uh, questionable. And the likelihood that China would invade Taiwan is questionable. It certainly hasn't um, made any uh, obvious uh, threats in that direction. Uh, and uh, what it has always asserted that it wanted a, a peaceful reunion of Taiwan with the rest of China. What are some other reasons possibly why people aren't joining the British Armed Forces? I'm suggesting that the reason is it's actually not a very good job. Um, the, uh, at various points, uh, in, I was telling Tina before this started, my cousin uh, had been a career soldier. Um, and for him, uh, it was a good life compared to working down a coal mine or a good life compared to working in a factory. Uh, he got to go and spend time in Germany. He got to go and spend... Uh, time in Gibraltar, uh, it, the idea of going somewhere warm and dusty uh, for, for months on end is remote. And I'll just mention here a little thing. Um, psychiatric casualties were higher in US forces than in British forces. Um, but what was interesting is that a lot of the, 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 the diagnosed uh, rates of psychiatric disorder were higher before deployment in uh, uh, US forces than British forces. Um, and that may well just simply be a, a feature of uh, the, the way the diagnoses are applied. But it may also be something to do with the fact that um, US forces, for example, were deployed for a year at a time. And in that time, they would get two weeks R&R. Um, &R. They would go home for two weeks in, in a whole year. And some of them who'd been, sent, been deployed for a year subsequently had that extended to 18 months. British troops, by contrast, uh, were, were allowed home for two weeks in, in a six-month tour of duty. Um, so the total UK armed forces today is uh, 152,400, with a further 32,280 reserves. Uh, these are slightly dated. Um, there has been a, a, a massive uh, a cam campaign to recruit, uh, which hasn't necessarily uh, worked very well. So... 2023 more left the armed forces than joined and that's been true for almost all but six years since 1999 um uh, the proportion of women has increased and i would argue as a socialist that's a that's a good thing uh but the reason why women have increased is largely because uh, men can't be recruited uh, and what i suggest is happening is a little bit of the the it's a good pay compared to what other jobs that women are doing is rather like nursing um and of course, uh, the comparative rates of pay for different um, uniform services is, is, is quite an important subject. For example, uh, in uh, uh, 1918, uh, before the, the police strikes in Liverpool and uh, London, uh, the, the police 
police officers were paid uh, commensurate with unskilled manual labour. After the, the strikes of 1918 and 1919, uh, they were, their pay was tied to skilled manual labour. And, and if you look now at police officers' pay, it's starting to slide and become sort of roughly around the rate of, say, a, a, a trained nurse uh, on about 33,000. Or, as I sometimes put it, not bad pay for women's work, given that there is a 20% deficit in, in women getting paid 20, about 20% 20 less than men, despite the Equal Pay Act and all the rest of it. And if you look at here, um, uh, the, also the, the very large numbers of Commonwealth recruits in, in the British Army, something like 38% are recruited from Commonwealth countries. Um, what's the likelihood of people who've come from Commonwealth countries uh, wanting particularly to die in, in uh, Ukraine um, in, in in a war which has i mean the, the reasons for joining uh the british army uh if, if you're from zimbabwe are that you get a first world rate of pay and that you can at least send some home but for example the pay for a trained soldier at the moment twenty three and a half thousand compared to twenty one and a half thousand for working in little army officer thirty seven and a half thousand compared to a, a, a little warehouse supervisor of sixty and a half thousand uh, and, and all that compares with, say, a trained nurse of 33. Um, finally, then, um, what does that then tell us, for example, you know, if we look at these questions around reservists and regular soldiers, what does it tell us about, for example, the Israeli Defence Force? Um, the Israeli regular service is 32 months for uh, men and 24 for women. Um, the professional soldiers uh, the, the permanent do permanent service uh, are a different group in a sense uh, but once you've done your regular service you're then a reservist and generally that reserve service is about a month a year uh, in the british army reserve for example it's 27 days a year but in as i understand from what i've read uh, in israel not everybody turns up to do their reserve service so the active personnel uh, in uh, the Israeli Defence Forces is, is, is around 170,000 with uh, nearly half a million in reserves. Uh, of the reservists, 360,000 were mobilised after the 7th of, of October. And of course, 300 assault rifles were distributed to West Bank settlers uh, to almost to use as they wish. Um, and so far, official estimates quoted in the Times of Israel is about 556 killed in, in the IDF. Other estimates I've seen are about 650 and possibly around 6,000 6, out of 30,000 Hamas fighters have been killed. But what we're seeing in, in, in Gaza is the kind of fierce... Uh, hand, well, fierce house-to-house uh, -house fighting, fighting in built-up areas uh, where the defenders know the land. Uh, and although um, it's, I'm not putting forward any argument here that the IDF will be defeated, uh, what we will see, I think, is a, a growing list of casualties uh, on both sides. Uh, but remember, there were three million Vietnamese uh, killed uh, as a result of the Vietnam War, and there were 58,000 US personnel killed, and the USA lost the war. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, comrade. That was a really excellent, wide ranging opening. And thank you for putting all that work in. I do hope you type it up as well or transcribe it so we can. Um have a little article after that because that was a, a, a lot of a lot of very useful information comrades if you have questions or want to make a contribution etc please click raise hand and i'll bring you in um to get the ball rolling a couple of points perhaps that we could discuss and that is the um the idea of the attitude of of communist socialists to the army and, and you did touch touch on that just thought we could um have a little quick standalone uh discussion on that so you know it's interesting that the 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 home the reserve army was was set up by by a communist um so he clearly thought it's a it's a good idea to have people with arms a lot of lefties you know will shudder at the thought of you know it's it's guns guns kill people etc we don't want guns we want peace etc but <laughs> You know, our our op our opponents, our enemy, they have all the guns. They have no problem using them. So socialists, communists, 
do want the people armed, don't they? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, um, there's been a discussion about this in weekly worker reports, and um, it's one of the reasons why I find I can support that that position. There's no doubt about it that a standing army, as we saw, for example, uh, in in the Spanish Revolution, is a way of of of, of keeping the working class under control. That's why it's there. Uh, yes, it's there to support um, British or American or whoever uh, any other imperial ambitions, um, but it's also there uh, to make sure the working class stays in control, uh, under control. Uh, and from that point of view, and actually, even the the founding of of the Amer of the young American Republic um, envisaged that a well ordered militia was the best way of ensuring that government did not become a tyranny. The way that that's been translated, of course, is that everybody should be allowed to have an M16 in the living room if needs be, uh, and that somehow that, that, that's, a, that's a, a democratic right. But that certainly wasn't the way in which the, the, the even the American constitution was, was, was written. Um, I would argue that a, 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 a proper workers' militia uh, w including, you know, having some kind of disciplinary function, you wouldn't just hand out guns to any Tom, Dick, and Harry. You you would want to ensure, just as the Bolsheviks did, in fact, um, that the um, the the that you were handing it out to to workers who were committed to maintaining socialism. Um, and in the end, uh, the other aspect of it, which I find important, and, and and the reason why I mentioned kind of things like rates of pay uh, for 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 all the uniform services, is that actually we're not looking today at, at, at a hugely um, privileged section of the population. My attitude towards uniform services is fraternise at every opportunity, uh, and because in the end we have to win them over. In the end, um, you know. The, the fate of Salvador Allende awaits us all if uh, if workers take power, uh, and and that that and there has to be some way of reconciling workers workers maintaining power uh, with with a standing army. There, there can't be a standing army except for you know the the the, the specialists that you need to train people. Um, However, it does depend on the context. I mean, it has to be remembered that Switzerland effectively has a citizen army. Every uh, male of military age, you know, we've always been a bit backward in Switzerland um, on on the question of gender. Uh, is you know every male has has their, their service weapon and uniform at home in the cupboard? Um, that doesn't make it socialist, obviously, uh, and. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a measure of the, the security with which the bourgeoisie feels in Switzerland and that they can allow that. The question is, could uh, uh, Britain or the United States going to war um, trust its population uh, with a, a huge citizen army? My guess is not. Mm. Um, and, uh, and my guess is also uh, that the, the relatively few people will join. Um, some the other thing to mention, of course, is the reserve army of labour affects the army. Um, mm. The army gets quite good recruits when um, there's high rates of unemployment and low rates of pay, uh, and it suddenly becomes a bit more attractive um, joining the army or navy or air force. Um, it's interesting to note, incidentally. Uh, there are differential rates of of good mental health in the different services. The healthiest uh, of them is the Royal Navy, and one of the reasons for that is there's almost nobody with no qualifications. I mean, everybody's very well qualified and, and trained, or whatever, and there aren't the same kind of contacts. But the next most healthy is the Royal Marines, and that's interesting because they they're likely to be in the thick of fighting. But look at them; they're selected in the first instance. Uh, they're have a high status, high rates of social cohesion. Um, they're not the cooks and the drivers, uh, and, and 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 that plays a part in their morale. Mm. So, yes, I mean, I'm completely in favour of a citizen army. Mm. So you're saying that actually the bourgeoisie, their talk about conscription is it, it's like a PR gag, isn't it? It's it's part That's of it. the drive to war, which will not be fought with a conscripted army. But us, we probably would 
you know, have some benefits from a conscripted army, a people's army of some sort, if I mean, it were a democratic control, but it, it would give you opportunities to 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 work as saboteurs, etc., to fraternize, to try and split the army. Friedrich Engels put his year in the Prussian artillery to very good use uh, in the revolutions of 1848 and became, as you know, a, a, a military expert, really. And some of the, some of the finest writings of, of, of Engels are on military matters, mm. uh, whether it's the peasant war in Germany or or, or whether it's his uh, excellent account of um, uh, the, the the U.S. Civil War. Mm. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to open up for discussion from the floor now, comrades. If you would like to come in and speak, please accept being made a panelist. Uh, but I can also just unmute you. Um, first is Steve. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Steve Steve Lee from um, Firebrand in the U.S. Um, yeah, I wanted to bring up the Vietnam War, in the, uh, especially the Army in the U.S. Oftentimes people get pessimistic and say uh, the, it's hard to win over the Army to the side of revolution or, or anything um, if it's made up of uh, people who volunteered whereas a conscript army is um, is more likely to be won over. In fact, in, during Vietnam, the leading forces in the anti-war movement in the military um, were actually people who had volunteered. And part of the reason for that was that they had volunteered under a uh, patriotic idea that they were doing a good thing and, and that kind of thing. Um, and in fact, once they found out what was going on, they, they turned against the war. And that, of course, was part of the, the the reason for that was be, there was a mass anti-war movement in the United States as well that, that uh, impacted the military. There's a really good book on this called Soldiers in Revolt uh, by Haymarket Books, um, which goes into, into the, how it was fundamentally the people who volunteered who were the basis of the anti-war movement. I think that gives us more hope um, that it's the political conditions that that really ba uh, are the basis of that. That didn't happen as much at all in the during the Iraq War, um, although there was a, a, a Iraq, uh, you know, anti-war movement in the army in Iraq. It was not near as widespread and didn't have the kind of impact. So it's really the political conditions that, that help to determine whether those uh, volunteers in the military will go over to the side of the, you know, of the anti-war side, um, and that. That means, you know, it's even more important for us to build a civilian as well, civilian anti-war movement, uh, if we're going to impact the military. But yeah, a little bit of that. Thank you very much. Interesting point. I, I agree. Yeah. I just briefly, just to say, I agree completely. And to mention uh, Siegfried Sassoon. Um, Siegfried Sassoon, the great first world poet of the First World War, um, uh, joined with full vigor uh, the, the the whole patriotic enterprise. He won the military cross. Um, he was known to his subordinates as Mad Jack because he would actually go out on patrol when he didn't need to. He, he went out on patrol because he wanted to. And uh, he won his military cross for, for seizing a, 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 an enemy position um, single-handed, as it were. Uh, it was whilst being treated at Craig Lockhart for shell shock uh, that uh, he um, not only wrote some of his finest poetry and influenced the poetry of Wilfred Owen, um, so that he wrote some of his greatest poetry afterwards. But Siegfried Sassoon wasn't suffering from shell shock. It's one of those rare cases where he was sent to Craig Lockhart rather than be shot because he had friends in higher places. Uh, or let's say he's got shell shock and, and pack him off to Craig Lockhart. And during that time, his contact with his psychiatrist, uh, one Captain Rivers, um, uh, persuaded him to go back to the front. But he, he was completely changed in terms of his attitude towards the, the First World War, and, uh, and and you know, fancy being sent to a psychiatric hospital because you think the slaughter of World War One is 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 a bad idea. Um, Thank you, um, um, William, please. Citizen Army is something that I would have a family connection with, being the grandson of an Irish Citizen Army volunteer. Now, the Irish Citizen Army was founded by James Connolly and James Larkin after the 
Torte in Lockout in Dublin, where there was a lot of police brutality against workers and they organised themselves in a defence force. When the, uh, the outbreak of the First World War, the unionists in the north of Ireland were able to get all the recruits they wanted because they had to prove their loyalty to the king. The, the Irish Home Rule Party, led by John Redmond, was after securing a Home Rule Act, which was supposed to be implemented but had to be uh, shelved for the duration of the war. And to show good faith, he recruited uh, a lot of uh, nationalists into the First World War. Now, Connolly took the position and he said that he was in part of the Republican movement. At that stage, he most certainly was not. Uh, he was an independent and he was socialist and communist. And he said that, no, uh, if you get, if they start bringing in conscription into Ireland, when you get your conscription papers, turn up at a citizen army office and join the Irish citizen army and not the British army. Now, at one stage, the actual Republicans, the IRB, kidnapped Connolly and he was missing for the best part of three weeks. And then he appeared without ever giving an explanation to where he was and what it was all about. But clearly, there was, after him, some serious negotiations went on because then he aligned himself with uh, the IRB, which were the Republican movement at the time. He, in on Easter Monday, when the horizon uh, was, uh, when they decided to go ahead with the horizon, he spoke to the citizen army <coughs> uh, from the steps of the Liberty Hall. And he said, we are now, the citizen army is now disbanded. And we are now the army of the Irish Republic. So that's how the IRA was born. He was an associate with that. Now, some of the statistics you have, I would argue against. Yet you were very, very low in the amount of people that were shot at down. There's a there's one thing you can give the Brits. They keep meticulous records, and if you look at their records, you will see the six hundred and one were executed. Uh, are shot at down for desertion and other things, and a lot of them were people that were suffering from. This. Usually, when they went back off leave, immediately they they would desert. But what's what's they would think? What's the bloody war all about? Now, Lennon said that the Irish Citizen Army was the first workers' army in the world to go into action, and we are very proud of that. Now, I know Trotsky took a completely different view, but I'm afraid we're going to support Lenin's position. He also said about Kharki being part of the, uh, coming from Germany. Well, actually, Kharki goes back to the Boer War. The British won their empire with their famous red coats. It was a dress uniform and a combat uniform, and it was a, something to be respected and feared. A fellow called John McBride, uh, who was living in Johannesburg at the time, uh, organised an Irish battalion, a uh, cavalry battalion. And he noticed that the Zulus used to tie bushes to their arms and legs and heads and, uh, and hide in the bushes when their enemies went by they would jump out and get them. So he decided that khaki, uh, a, a, a green uniform with brown stripes on it would, would uh, hide them and the British wouldn't be able to wear the red coats. It was like a lighthouse. Snipers could take them off. And the casualties in the Boer War were the highest casualties the British ever had to suffer before or since. They suffered 70, 70 to 1 casualties. And that was down to John McBride. Now, John McBride was the father of Sean McBride, who founded Amnesty International. 
and uh, he wasn't a particularly nice chap. Uh, I think the feminists would call him a misogynist, and I think they'd be dead right in calling him that, because he was found debating his wife. And but that doesn't mean he wasn't a good soldier. Now he was executed as one of the leaders of the nineteen sixteen rising, which is something he wasn't. He actually joined the rising on the morning of Easter Monday. He was it was a bank holiday. He was all dressed up and he was going chasing women again, his favourite pastime. And he was all dressed up in his good suit and he was going through Stephen's Green in Dublin. And he's seeing them setting up barricades. And he said, what are you doing? Oh, they said, we're going to have a bit of a, a, a rebellion. Oh, where are you now? Do you have a spare rifle? Yeah. And he, that's how he joins. But when the British realised who he was, they were going to make him pay for what happened in, uh, in, in, in South Africa. And he was executed. It was out of sheer revenge. Now... Okay, come, for, can you um, kind of... I, really, I was just saying about George Orwell. <laughs> I mean, anyone who writes a thing like 1984, An Animal Farm, after coming back from Spain, is certainly suffering from mental disease. Right? It's not only the height of absolute disillusionment and complete and utter nonsense. Now, will there be conscription? Yes, there will be conscription. If there's need to be conscription, the establishment will find ways of doing it. They'll take people out of jails. They'll find all sorts of reasons. They, they'll create, stop people from signing the toll. They'll do anything they want. They, 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 they'll they find ways of bringing in conscription if they want conscription. So don't think that there's going to be any resistance against it, because there's not. Right? And where's, the, where's conscription taking place now at the moment? In the Ukraine. They're even recruiting old women and old men of 60. They're going around press ganging them into the army because they haven't got enough people left. That could happen in Britain. It's just handy. And the propaganda that we have to listen to about what the war is going on in Ukraine is absolutely sickening. It's, there's no question that they, 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 they're trying to tell us that Zelensky is not a fascist when everyone that has any political understanding at all knows that he's an out and out fascist. So that's it. There are my points. Hopefully It'd be helpful. Got out of your chest. Thank you, William. <laughs> Ian, did you want to reply or should I take somebody else? I'll come back to other things. It's just a pleasure to listen to William, actually. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I was just saying it's just a pleasure to listen to you. That's fine. I'll, I'll, there's a couple of points I'll come back to but later. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mark, hi. Yeah, yeah. Cheers for the talk. Um, I must say I agree with the last speaker's final conclusion. If there is a necessity for conscription, there will be conscription. It's as simple as that. And we've seen uh, what is possible under this government with its support for what's happening in Palestine and, and in Israel. And obviously in the past, as a British socialist, I've seen what they're capable of doing and read about what they're capable of doing in, in Ireland. This is a slight aside to to what the uh, to, to the main body of of, of the talk, uh, and relates back to why were the uh, people unwell in the Gulf War? And I think, in truth, I think it has largely been established. It was due to organophosphates. Uh, professor, the Empress Professor Malcolm Hooper. Uh, from Sunderland did a lot of work on this. At the time, it was connected also to the work of a shepherd called uh, Brenda Sutcliffe, who had discovered uh, Professor Solly Zuckerman's uh, research paper, which was undertaken back in the early 1950s, which was placed in the House of Commons and forgot. And it simply said deadly poison on the front of that. Uh, she did a fantastic job. Uh, Brenda, and at one point she had, uh, and I had, uh, around 1,000 shepherds who we believed had committed suicide as a result of being forced to dip sheep dip with organophosphates in it. And Malcolm Hooper and Brenda worked closely together and later worked closely together with people uh, who also airline pilots who uh, 
have been uh, poisoned, in essence, through the air bleed in major aircraft. And that's a campaign which Unite has been supporting pilots who are getting substantial uh, compensation, a few million pounds in some place, in some cases. In terms of the, the lads that set up the Gulf War campaign, uh, they were mainly, the, the main leaders of that were from Hull and Sunderland, which were prominent places where people came from and went to serve uh, in the Gulf in the Gulf War. And uh, if I recall rightly, the six main characters, and it's some time ago I'm speaking about now, all died before they were 50. Uh, all of them had, didn't see any active service actually in the Gulf War, uh, but they, they attributed through Malcolm Hooper's work. And I can send you the information. I've still got it. I wrote quite a bit about it as I was learning uh, to write professionally, was uh, back in the Northeast at the time. Um, so there's plenty of stuff on that. Uh, doesn't take away from the rest of the things. What's the slight aside, and I was interested to hear the American comrade come on, is that uh, uh, in the United States of America, Gulf War syndrome was was uh, recognised and compensation was given to the, uh, I think it was the regular army. And as I understand it, again, I'll have to go back and check this out, I think it was when uh, down in Florida, when I think uh, black voters were prevented from uh, going to vote. Was it in the 2004 election? And it led to, uh, was it one of the Bushes winning the election? It was those soldiers which were mobilized to prevent the black vote coming out. So there was a direct uh, involvement of soldiers who'd been, who'd been in the things. Now, one thing I've always known and which is known by many soldiers, and I've got lots of friends of mine who have been soldiers, uh, is that how badly soldiers are treated after they come out of the armed forces. And uh, when I was working in London for a while, for about a year, I was working Saturdays and Sunday nights in uh, Soho in a, in a hostel, 147-bed hostel, and at least a third of the people in that were were soldiers, uh, ex-soldiers, uh, who were in uh, terrible uh, situ situ situations. It was difficult to be sympathetic entirely with them because they were so aggressive uh, that you basically had to stay out of the way on many occasions, especially on the on the on the night shift. But that has an impact generally on other people who learn that they'll be badly treated afterwards. I, I feel. On that, on that situation. This is, uh, I had many conversations, many, many, many conversations with ex-soldiers. Uh, and what you also find is that some of them deeply regret what they've actually uh, done. Uh, my best mate was a servant soldier. He went AWOL after his experiences in the early 70s uh, in Belfast. Uh, he was imprisoned and uh, uh, chucked out after six months of, of the army. But some of them do deeply regret what they've actually done. And uh, however, uh, opportunities to perhaps unburden themselves, and I'm not making excuses for people here under any circumstances, means that they're forbidden under the Official Secrets Act to actually speak about these experiences and that makes it difficult to uh, to really come to terms with what you've what you've ac actually done. There was uh, one other point, but uh, I, I'm sorry, I've I've forgotten it. I'm actually doing all the ironing at the moment, so that's one of my favorite <laughs> favorite things. So I'll be getting back to that, to be honest with you. So anyway, it was it, a good man. talk. Anyway, cheers, cheers for that. And sorry, I've been able to come other times. I've been working Thursday nights. If you if you can remember your point, I can bring you back in. No, oh, sorry, it, it, it wouldn't be that important. It's <laughs> as I said, the points I'm making they are not as important right. as what's the general point which uh, Ian was has generally been made throughout this. Anyway, cheers. Thank you very much, comrade. Do you want to say something, or shall we take some somebody we'll else? Take some That's fine. Okay, um, Paul, please. Yeah. Um, we look back to the uh, Second World War with the Home Guard. And the ideas put forward by uh, 
within the Trotskyist movement and also independent Labour Party uh, and, and others, and, Winter, and Tom Winteringham. Uh, this is related to the question of large-scale recruitment of workers to the army and the prevailing atmosphere of anti-fascism. Because uh, a lot of people who joined the army at that time, uh, either volunteering for or armed forces, I, I, either volunteering or conscripted, saw the war as an anti in Britain as an anti-fascist war. They didn't see it as an imperialist war. I mean, it was an imperialist war, but the reason why people uh, joined up or, or willing to be recruited uh, was because they thought it was an, an, an anti-fascist war. And what you had with uh, the, what Trotsky called the proletarian military policy was an attempt to key into the anti-fascist sentiments and try to push the war in that direction. Because if you've got several million people in Britain and in the USA, we had similar sort of feelings, uh, working class people, largely middle class people who would uh, often be very progressive, uh, you know, that is a massive force. And if you have the go from anti-fascism to anti-capitalism, I mean, that is a, a massive force in, in favour of it. It wasn't like the First World War where it was a god king and country war uh, in the Allied countries. In, uh, in, in Britain, the, the ruling class had to adopt the language of the left, admittedly the popular front left. You look at uh, even Churchill's speeches, you can see he sort of grudgingly accepted uh, these sort of ideas that were floating around, not in his part of the political spectrum, but on, on more towards the left. So there was a real potential. And I think that merely re repeating this, the left-wing slogans from the First World War weren't sufficient. And there had to be an addressing of the fact that Nazi Germany was indeed murderous, as we know, but also that the uh, and, and a deadly threat to workers and minorities wherever. Uh, but you had this mass anti-fascist sentiments amongst the uh, the armed forces themselves, and I think that was necessary to key into that. That doesn't apply at the moment because uh, you know you've got a, a I mean, it didn't really apply after the Second World War because you then go for uh, the wars that Britain was involved in. After the Second World War, there's no way that any of them could be portrayed as any, any, anything uh, sort of like anti-fascist. Uh, however, they try to make out uh, Argentine hunters and uh, Saddam Hussein as the new witness, or Gamal Nasser for that matter. Um, what we've got today, I think, is this... Um, the liberals are really, it's mainly liberals, although it's right-wing social democrats and, and the Tories in Britain, uh, not so much in, this, in the America where you've got an isolationist trend growing up around the, the Trumpers. Uh, the liberals are getting incredibly militaristic. I mean, just today in the newspaper, in The Guardian, Timothy Gartnass is going on about how we must uh, help Ukraine win. I mean, the... This is delusional. I mean, because the thing is, in the paper yesterday, it said 10% of the British population think that Ukraine can actually win the war. 10%, despite all the uh, incessant propaganda about how Ukraine's uh, doing and that. And in America, I, I, according to a broadcast I was uh, listening to, 12% of the population think that uh, Ukraine could win. In other words, a a tiny proportion of the population, considering the amount of pro-war propaganda there's been, actually think this is going to, uh, Ukraine can win. And of course, uh, popular opinion here is is right. Uh, if you listen to, uh, say, John Mearsheimer, a professor from uh, Chicago, uh, the man who's actually had a military career before he became an academic, international relations guy, he makes it very clear why Ukraine can't win a war of attrition against Russia. And yet we are being continually entreated by, especially liberals, that this war is one that must be supported, must be backed, and the population must get behind this. Now, what I think the 
these military figures are speaking. Now, the chap who called for a sort of a conscription, he got cl shouted down a bit politely, but told to, that's not the line. What I think they're aiming for is a sort of a war-mindedness amongst the population. In other words, not recruit, not, not conscription. They don't want a load of people who don't want to be in the army. It's a waste of time for the military machine itself. The officers don't want a load of blokes who don't want to be in the army. But what they want is a population that is more willing to accept the realities of war. When I grew up in the 1960s, the, the Second World War, or the war, the last war, and I still call it that, uh, was everyone's consciousness. You know, my, my parents lived through it as my mum as a, as, as a young civilian, my dad as a, as a conscript soldier. Everyone had friends, relations, and that who'd been through a total war. Nowadays, how many people actually know anyone in the armed forces in Britain? Next to nobody. Uh, it's very unusual. To, if someone says, oh, he's, a, he's in the army, he's in the Navy. Blimey, that's unusual. What I think they're trying to do is to prepare this atmosphere of war-mindedness that there are wars going on and you're not just a spectator to them, you're part of a whole kind of ethos around it. And from within that atmosphere, the army, the, or the armed forces will have uh, a better chance of recruiting from there. So it's a, trying to shift the kind of feelings amongst youth today who, for whom war is a spectator sport, not much different to playing a, a computer game or something that Brandad might have got involved in you know, ages ago. But what they want to do is create an atmosphere in which militarism is more accepted, and then they've got a better chance of uh, recruiting more people. Um, fin finally, um, the idea of a workers' militia today, I think, is, a, is, is really a bit utopian, because we, we, when you're talking about workers' militias today, you're talking about the position of dual power. Uh, now, the military policy, the Trotskyist ones, the ILPs, one, uh, Wintringham, Orwell, in the last war, was about trying to shift a, a bourgeois army into some sort of revolutionary force because you've got loads of workers there on a progressive line of anti-fascism. There's nothing like that today. And I think talking about replacing the army with a militia as some kind of short, medium-term thing is really it's unrealistic. It's something we, you know, maybe when things hold up a bit. But I think that that is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a non-issue at the moment, I think. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave, oh yeah, someone just put up about uh, growing up in the 60s about First World War. Yeah, my grandparents were, too, uh, were involved in the First World War, you know, either as civilians or as, as servicemen. So, you know, growing up, up until sort of that, well, really into the 1980s and that, there was still this image of war around. Well, it's part of a national kind of ethos, if that's the right word. But that's died out as the older generations have died out. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Conrad. Thanks, Paul. Shall I take a couple of more? Uh, I'll just come back on a couple of little things. Um, I mean, I agree with almost everything that Paul said, but I just would like to make this point, I suppose. There's a tendency on the part of the left to regard anybody who's in uniform services as somehow being irredeemably right-wing or authoritarian or whatever. And if you know service personnel, you will know there's a tendency to always being right-wing and being authoritarian. That doesn't mean to say they all are. And moreover, it doesn't mean to say it doesn't change. And... Um, the history of uh, mass armies is of changes in consciousness. I mean, the um, the rebellions at Etaple weren't usually ascribed to um, an awareness of the Russian Revolution, but the uh, rebellions in the French army were. And um, and there's no reason to believe that at Etaple there wasn't some awareness of it as well. Um, 
I, 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 I agree that you know it's it's a, it's about moving to a, a state where we're prepared to put up with a lower rate of pay or a lower standard of living in order to pay for the next war uh, as much as anything else. Um, it, it, of course, they could introduce conscription. My feeling is that it's more trouble than it's worth to the bourgeoisie. Um, but if they could, I mean, there, there is some evidence that there's been uh, some response to what is a very kind of widespread recruiting uh, thing in, in on Facebook and elsewhere. Uh, coming back to one other little thing um, about Orwell and, and homage to Catalonia and uh, animal farm and so on. Orwell's uh, um, target really was Stalinism. He saw the way, I mean, he starts off homage to Catalonia by saying that the Communist Party of Spain was on the right, not the left, uh, of, of the Republican forces. Um, he, uh, when he was standing on the roof of a building, of the, of the Poon building, protecting it from uh, the, 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 the armies, the, the Republican army, um, you know, he was saying, given a choice between um, knowing where, which side he's on, he's on the side of the proletariat. And um, uh, it, it, all, all, all well was, you know, didn't write Animal Farm and, and 1984 because of a hostility to socialism. He, he, he wrote it as a hostility to Stalinism. Uh, and, and that was the important thing. In a sense, Homage to Catalonia is his finest work. Um, yeah, they could try and introduce conscription. How far will it get? Um, until relatively recently, uh, a lot of countries in Europe had partly conscript armies. And and how successful was it? I mean, some people don't mind. I mean, some people don't mind um, going away with a TA and getting paid for going hill walking. It's a different thing altogether to, to actually realise you're going to be shot at. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Tony. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, I enjoyed your talk thoroughly, and it was very interesting, Ian, about a subject I knew relatively little about. Uh, I also echo what you said about Orwell. I th I've always seen Orwell as uh, particularly prescient in terms of uh, the development of an authoritarian state, uh, and certainly his uh, comment uh in Animal Farm about everyone being equal, but some being more equal than others, I think uh, struck a nerve, as it were, in terms of Stalinism. But I, I just wanted to throw... Uh, I, I don't see conscription be, as being on the agenda in the imminent or even in the near future. Uh, and I, again, I think the ruling class will adopt it as a very last resort. But I just wanted to throw out this, that... Wars are also becoming increasingly automated. Uh, and we see that in Ukraine, where Russia has unleashed uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of drones. Uh, and Israel has done much the same. Uh, I don't think it's had a very good experience of the reserve army, most of which have been withdrawn, both for economic reasons and because of the casualties they've experienced. So. Uh, I just thought uh, you might want to comment on whether, in fact, the wars of the future may be wars fought between, as much as anything else, different machines and the better technology will prevail. I'll leave it at that. Good point. I once met a woman in the Royal Artillery. You wouldn't normally associate women with the Royal Artillery because uh, you, you, the whole thing was you have to bloody great big shells into the back of guns. <laughs> um she effectively went to war with an Xbox. Uh, that's what she did. She, she used her skills honed on, on PlayStation and Xbox uh, to fly drones because what the Royal Artillery really needs is to be able to see where the target is. And yes, uh, and of course, you know, artillery is so last century, um, except not everywhere. I mean, and one of the striking things about um, the Ukraine war is that it's 21st century meets almost 19th century. You know, it, you've got First World War trench warfare combined with um, high-tech uh, 
um, satellites being able to pinpoint targets. Um, one of the things that Hamas fighters are up against is uh, heat signatures. You, you, you've not only got to be bloody fast to get get away from uh, a response from IDF tank or whatever else, but you, you know, given that you've got heat vision. Um, and you know an attack helicopter can shoot through walls with no problem at all um so yes it's very technical and uh, but and my fear is well my suspicion is that if there's a, a war with china with um and so on that, that it will be at one removed it will be somebody using an xbox to drop some very large payloads on, mm -hmm. on chinese people Exactly. I mean, it is kind of depends on the war, isn't it? And what the aim is of the war. I mean, if you if you want to, if you're fighting for territory, then you'll need to secure that territory. How are you going to do it? Do you need boots on the ground for that? I mean, to drop a nuclear bomb, you just need a couple of people. But that's an entirely different way of warfare, isn't it? Steve, please. Thank you, Tina. Uh, thank you, Ian, as well. That was very, very good talk. I enjoyed that. Um, I just want to try and uh, maybe draw a distinction, I think, between what you might call uh, a people's army, a people's militia, and a workers' militia. Because they, they, I think you need to draw, you need to separate them because often they get mixed up sometimes and we start talking about one or the other. So I think a people's militia, a citizen's army, citizen's defence force, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, whatever, really arise out of the defence of an area, defence of a community, even the defence of a nation. By and large, it's to defend people for defending themselves. Whereas a workers' militia, I think, probably comes from the defence of the picket line, people say, you know, and a workers' militia is more likely to be a socialist, is more likely to be, I mean... A people's army could have socialists in it, but it wouldn't be socialist. You know, a Republican army, for like, w wouldn't be necessarily socialist, whereas a, a workers' militia may or may not be, but it's more likely to be socialist in its, in it, in its ideas. And, of course, um, republicanism always was always opposed in the past on principle to the idea of a bureaucratic professional standing army which was associated with the monarchy. And that was Marx's position. Uh, if we go back to the programme of the German Communist Party in 1848, for example. So there was always an opposition, regardless of whether they were about to arrive at socialism or the working class was about to take power, the, that Republican... And it goes back, of course, to the Roman Republic. Because in the early days, the Roman Republic had a citizen's army and it was a republic. It was basically farmers who got tooled up, went off for a few months, then came back to their fields again. They were, it wasn't a professional army in any sense. It was a people's army. Later, of course, when Rome became the empire, somewhere on the line in that transition, the imperial legions were really a professional army. They went away for years and probably never never returned over two or three years or whatever on a stint, and they were out there to get as much as they possibly could. Completely different things, but that was the difference there goes back to the ideas of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. An imperial army has got to go abroad and conquer other people as opposed to defending the people. And I was thinking of a, our own example. I was thinking of the Battle of the Bogside in August uh, 1969 when thousands of residents of the Bogside district organised themselves into the Derry Citizens Defence Association and they fought off the RUC, they fought off the B specials, they fought off the loyalists. Um, they defeated the loyalist mobs that were attacking them. They set up barricades, we had stones, they had petrol bombs. And they were so successful that the British Army, the R eventually the RUC had to be withdrawn and the British Army came in instead to take over um, because the RUC had been defeated. And then Derry became a kind of a no-go area. It was called Free Derry. And so almost like a people's own area until October. It was ended in October 1969, so it only went on for a new month. But here we have a, an idea of, a pe of the people getting together to defend their area 
against fascists or orange or beef specials or whatever, you know, that that sort of idea. So I think that 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 if we're talking in those terms, then it is it isn't possible that we want to argue a socialist if we're not ready for a red army at the moment where things are, but we may want to say we don't want this professional standing army. We should be opposed to that right now. And we should be in favour of a democratic people's army, citizens' army. I won't go on about Ukraine. I think there's a whole argument there, but look, we're getting late now, so I'll stop at that point. Okay, thanks, Steve. Shall I take Matthew as the last speaker? Yeah, and then you can reply to both. Hi, Matthew. I think you're unmuted already. Oh, no, you're not. It's not where I can... We had the same problem last week, but I managed... Yeah, yeah no. There you are, we heard you. We heard. Is that the... Yep, go ahead. Right. Okay. I think the, the, there is an issue with this. Um, I, I do agree. I think mostly with what Paul said. Um, there's, you know, obviously, you know, what they really want is, is, is to militarize the society if they can, because obviously it requires a huge sacrifice on the part of the of the mass of the working class who to pay for this stuff. You know, and the problem that they've got in Ukraine really. Is the fact that they can't the the, um, the NATO powers, the Butchers Alliance, are not equipped to fight a prolonged war. I mean, what the wars they've been fighting up till now, the likes of the, the you know the Afghanistan or Iraq or any of these other wars, are relatively low level and can be fought from existing stock of ammunition, etc. Rather than a war of a proper war of attrition, as is happening in Ukraine, and they simply don't have the manufacturing capacity. Because obviously most of it has been has been privatised and so on, sent out to to, to capital. Uh, I mean, if you look at the, the, the what happened to um, you know the, the, the Royal Armaments uh, in in Britain, I mean, they, they, you know, they, they, they've offloaded it. So effectively, all the capacity is gone. You know, and if you look here, here in, in Glasgow, the the last job done by the big Bishopton plant out, out, out in Renfrewshire was to supply Saddam Hussein. It was working its arse off from that, and then they shut it. It's now a housing estate. So they just can't, I mean, the simple problem they've got is they just can't manufacture enough artillery shells or, or any of this other stuff that they require. Um, and so, I mean, the other thing, of course, is that, that obviously there simply aren't enough people in, in Ukraine. I mean, most most you know, the sensible one has fled the country, you know, when they could when it started. Uh, and actually, of course, every time they, they, they say, well, we need to, to conscript more, more people, people flee, you know, because why would they want to get, you know, ground up in this? You know? So the problem, that's really the problem they've got. I can't see that they, you know, and the other thing, of course, in terms of Britain, of course, is they, even, the, you know, historically, there have been areas where, you know, working class kids go into the military, but the problem is, of course, they get treated so badly that essentially they've destroyed that culture, you know. Uh, the British have always got this historical thing, they always treat their squaddies and so on, and they're very, very, very badly. And so, I mean, eventually that, that, that gets through and people just, you know, and, and of course they, they messed up everything anyway. So I really don't think they, they, they can conscript to that degree. The problem they've got, as I say, is, 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 is the manufacturing issue. But in terms of Ukraine, I mean, the, the, the thing is, obviously, you've got, you know, there aren't these changes in technology, and you can play. I mean, the likes of the Yugoslav wars, the, the Serbs, I think, discovered that, of course, if you take the door off your microwave, it has a heat signature very similar to a tank, um, and therefore you can put a load of these things around the middle place, and it, and it saves a bunch of your real tanks. Um, so there are all these games you can play with, with all these detectors, and the, the, obviously the, the in Vietnam, the same, you know all sorts of methods of trying to baffle detectors of one kind or another. Um, the, the, the problem that they, the, the thing is what you've got, of course, is that a lot of, I mean, likes to say artillery now, of course, is, is, is all mechanised. You haven't got people feeding shells into the back of a gun. You've got a machine that fills shells into the back of a gun, and the machine is mounted on a track or a set of wheels, and you wheel it in there, and it automatically shoves out, you know, however many rounds you, you, you plug into it. So the, the guy can control it, can be, you know, three miles away or whatever else, uh, sitting on his Xbox and, you know, fire off all these shells in the, in the direction of, you know. And the, the, the issue you've also got, of course, is that with the drones, is it effectively what it's done is it's eliminated, you know, the basis of having armoured vehicles.
course, because all you can do with drones, of course, is you can drop these armor-piercing uh, projectiles or you can fire the drone through the to the tank or wherever it is. Uh, uh, and so it really creates this, this issue. So in those terms, it gets more and more technical. And th th this also, of course, is a problem for, for, for in terms of conscription, because obviously as armies... I mean, the, you know, the issue with having people's militia or whatever else is actually the whole basis of, of actual military is that military practice and doctrine and so on and so forth is increasingly technical and increasingly requires, you know, that experience and, and, and taking on, you know, past, um, the past and so on and so forth and, and an ability to control these very complicated, build these very complicated machines, you know, which is not something you're going to get, you know, uh, from fighting on a, on, a, on a housing estate or whatever else. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 it's going in the opposite direction. And it, and it is then also, of course, going towards automated you know, AI machines to, to go around and kill people, uh, which is the next thing. Uh, the, 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 obviously, the ruling class wants to do this, but they don't want to say to people, we'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have a fleet of machines and they'll come around and kill people. You know, because, because, you know, Obviously, that there'll be an outcry against that, rightly so. But but that's the way they're going. And you can see, I mean, the likes of the likes of Google and so on and so forth will all have divisions that, that are building these these these, these type of machines uh, for killing people. Um, you know, so in those terms, it, 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 it's going to get it's going to get interesting. But the problem they've got, of course, is to persuade the working class. Well, their their living standard. Living standard, the mass of the population has to go down substantially. Well, they can do these things, and and, and that is going to be their, their real problem. Thank you, Matthew. Um, very interesting discussion, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, Ian, if you want to reply to a few things and perhaps sum it all up, that would be marvellous. So I, I, I don't disagree with any, any of what Matthew said. Uh, I, I think... There's currently a, the, the Royal British Legion, which is an, has an interesting history in its in its own right. It came into being um, to prevent soldiers becoming politicised after being discharged during after World War One, and it's currently having a campaign for people to sleep out in the open in March, in solidarity, as it were, with uh, homeless ex-soldiers and the like. Well, why the hell are they homeless? You know. Um, although the pay isn't great, there's, there's not many people in the armed forces that, that are starving or whatever. You could argue um, that they're not well equipped to deal with civilian life afterwards and not well paid enough during their service time, unless they do the full 22 years and then they get a, a decent resettlement grant and that kind of thing and a pension and so on. But if you're going to do three years and and, and then come out, then you're not necessarily going to be equipped with very much, particularly. Um, you're right, they don't treat them very well, particularly. Uh, obviously, it's considerably better going in being an officer, but it obviously depends what, what you're going to do. What I found interesting in, from, from my experience is that um, the people who are, have the greatest difficulty are the, the people who join... The, the logistics core or something like that and they, they, they spend their time as a cook or a driver or whatever um largely move from one unit to another and so on and, and there's a relative lack of cohesion and, and, and those are the ones who tended to turn up at the at military medical centers complaining of anxiety and depression and those kinds of things or put differently all the pressures that exist in the armed forces are exactly the same as for the rest of the population. The armed forces are not a separate population. And um, even, even if you allow for the fact that it, we have an entirely volunteer armed forces, they're not a separate population. Just as the police are not a separate population, the overwhelming majority of them have come from what we might broadly call working class backgrounds. I don't necessarily mean you know, they're all going to be politicised or whatever else, or, or, or inclined to be left-wing. But their experience isn't terribly different. It was very noticeable in the minor strike, and people who've been watching the, the, the series on the minor strike recently will have observed that um, the police had to be used from London, London Metropolitan Police, who were usually paid better anyway, and moved up to Yorkshire or wherever else because they knew the people they'd been to school with in the police. And they'd been in the police because they didn't want to go down the coal mines and so on. But they nevertheless 
lived in the same village, lived in the same area, the same county at least. Um, uh, so, so breaking up, you know, using I mean, it, it, it was another feature, for example, of the the, the, the great truce of of, 19, of of Christmas 1914, when when British and German soldiers got out of the trenches and started fraternising. Um, uh, Robert Graves in Goodbye to All That, which is a magnificent book. Robert Graves was commissioned in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers uh, before subsequently going on to become a great poet and writing um, um, I, Claudius, and so on. Anyway, in the Royal Welsh, he remembers <laughs> men firing off whole belts of ammunition just to boil water for tea <laughs> because they didn't actually want to shoot anybody. Uh, they didn't want to shoot Germans particularly, they, they recognised they were in exactly the same position as then. And uh, and so the high command recognised that there was collusion going on between the British and German forces in, in, all, in Christmas 1914. And so consequently, they moved soldiers about so that they couldn't get to know the people uh, in, the, in the regiment, in the German regiment, in the trenches opposite. They moved them about and they arbitrarily shelled even when they didn't need to even when it wasn't for an attack to break up any kind of possibility of colluding between um supposedly enemy forces uh, and the, the <laughs> we all seem to, uh, lots of people on the left seem to think that revolution is some kind of thing in the far far distant future and you know in the meantime the ruling class thinks it's just around the corner and um and is, is deeply concerned about uh, whether you can have enough of an army to even keep the working class under control. Uh, this is why I've always, which is why I argue that we should fraternise with uniform service personnel at every opportunity and not regard them instantly as the enemy. Um, I, I agree with the idea that we're being in, invited to embrace a military economy where we have to take lower uh, standard of living in order to pay uh, for for weapons and so on. But it's not lost on anybody, I would suggest. Uh, and um, next time, you know, we're told there's no money for the NHS, but, oh, by the way, uh, we need another war with the Houthis or whoever else, I don't think it's lost on anyone. Um, my feeling is that there is now, for the first time in a very long time, a worldwide movement. It's disparate, it's inchoate, it's, but it's firmly and resolutely able to see the, the, the naked reality of Israel, the United States, Britain, the worst imperialist countries of the world, um, and, and is able to make those connections. Whether that then turns into a movement that can make a difference is down to people who are politicised enough to, to to make any kind of commitment to the left whatsoever, and uh, and, I, and I think now uh, the, now that Starmer has um, completely revealed him, well he, what he always was, apart from when he was a Trotskyist, of course. Um, it, well, apart from you know, no no one can surely have any kind of illusions in the Labour Party, and I think the the next few years uh, will will be very interesting. Um, one of the other great military writers, apart from Clausewitz, of course, was Sun Tzu. And as he observed, if you sit on the riverbank long enough, you'll watch the bodies of your enemies drift by. And on that note, thank you very much, comrade. Thank you very, very much, Ian. It was a great session. Thank you for doing such a great presentation. And thank you for your comments and contributions, comrades. It's a really good, really just good discussion. I think we're, we're actually, a lot of us learned new things. Um, you know, our sessions are always very interesting when we have a debate or something, which we're going to have next week, for example. But this was a very educational session as well. Please join us next week. We're going to look at the solution. What is the solution in the Middle East? Um, we're going to have somebody making the point for a one state solution, two state solution, socialist solution, federal republic. So there's going to be different points of view being put forward, hopefully with some kind of resolution, perhaps. So at least it'll educate and entertain our audience and probably shed some light on the horrific situation in the Middle East. Thank you very much, comrades, and we'll see you next week.